technology uh, is increasing. They're, they're coming up with new and better treatments. And the people that are kind of on the low end of the totem pole, believe it or not, are, are doctors. The doctors are, are shouldering the cost. Like they're getting, from what I'm hearing, I'm just trying to understand it, but from what I'm hearing, they're getting paid. You told me one time, what was that on, uh, what's that thing you're supposed to do, the colonoscopy or whatever? Oh, yes. Where they used to get paid like. Ooh, they used to get paid uh, quite, a, quite a bit of money. Uh, you know, um, over $1,000 per procedure. That got cut down to $300 uh, per procedure, and they had to make it up in volume. So it just became like a, what do you call it? A, like a, an assembly line. Assembly you know? line. Just there were stretchers and people no. out in the hallway. It was kind of like, you know, at the airport where they have the planes queued up. <laughs> mm -hmm. for the last time I went for a colonoscopy, I was on a stretcher in a line of stretchers. Oh, my gosh. Really, we shouldn't have put this as financial. This should just be top concerns of doctors. Yeah. Um, you know, the reality of it is that... Uh, it sounds like stress has got to be higher than it ever was. Yes. I mean, do you think that today's doctor in medical school realized he was signing up for this? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I've met some younger doctors and, and again, you know, they're coming out with a different philosophy. I think they're start, you know, they're coming out, thinking that they're going to go to a salaried position. Uh, back in my day, everybody wanted to go out, be independent, start their own practice, uh, build something of their own, kind of an entrepreneurial uh, spirit. Uh, now the younger doctors are kind of resigned to uh, going out and getting a job. Uh, I know a lot of young doctors are doing what's called locum tenens work, where you just keep traveling and switching your location sites and getting paid by a locum tenens, uh, you know, company. Uh, hmm. They're looking more for, you know, a, a laid back lifestyle and not really building something and accumulating a, a, a good amount of wealth. Hmm. Interesting. So financially, I'm looking at all this stuff here. Um, what do you see coming in the future? Is it going to get any better or where do you see it? I, I think it's going to become more and more segmented. Uh, I think uh, there may be a chance where, where there, we, we do end up with socialized medicine. Uh, I could see primary care being taken over by nurse practitioners and physician assistants in the future because nobody's going into primary care anymore because the volume is just tremendous. Um, I, I think a lot of people like myself go into medicine because we were altruistic. Uh, you know, we, we love to help people. Uh, we, we love to uh, practice our skills and, and provide uh, relief for the, the suffering and, and also to help people stay healthy. Uh, however, it is a job. And, and I remember when I started, I sat down with a financial planner and he got me squared away and he set me up with life insurance, disability insurance. He started a deferred benefit plan for me. And, you know, I worked hard and I had some money to put into all those vehicles. And I did that for about 20 years, John. I was never really impressed with, with what was going on in that deferred benefit plan. Uh, always wish I could invest in something that would have gotten me more growth because as the years went on and I became more and more fatigued, I would have liked to have the option maybe to slow down, see less patients, do less, but the financial need 
kept me operating at, at a high level. And I think that's going on today with a lot of doctors where they enjoy what they're doing, but they'd like to do it more on their terms. And they're, they, you know, I always run into a guy, hey, do you got a good stop pick, a, a good stock tip? I've got 20 grand, you know, where can I put it where I, I, I can make a, a lot of money? Doctors are super busy, but, but they're looking for some type of financial security as well, just, just like anybody. So because of the, you know, the higher overhead and, and having to work much harder to yeah. get the same result. The bottom and, line, if, if you don't show up and lay hands on people, you don't get paid. And uh, you can use physician extenders like, uh, you know, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, things of that sort, but you still got to pay them. So somebody's got to physically be there in order for money to come in. And yes. what I always fantasized about was being able to use some of the money I was earning and put it somewhere where I didn't have to physically be there to get, get some money coming in. And, and if I had that cushion, I could practice more on my own terms rather than having to, uh, you know, be on that treadmill just to keep my nose above the water. So really that would be like, um, Did you, I guess I'm just trying to phrase what you were saying. It's kind of like wanting a, some sort of light at yeah. the end. Like an exit strategy, you know? Uh, in, the yeah. old days, uh, in the old days, doctors had an exit strategy. They would practice for as long as they wanted and they would sell their practice and that would be their retirement. That went the way of vinyl records. Uh, nobody's doing that anymore. Uh, hospitals are now acquiring practices, but uh, they're basically uh, really buying lists of people, and then they force the doctor to work for three to five years, and they basically work off what they're paying them anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's not the nest egg that it used to be. So in an ideal situation, they would have a clear exit strategy yeah. and they could we, actually see, you know, it's a question I always ask of clients kind of like is, if you think about it, the real gauge of how successful whatever strategy you're using work, you know, business wise, financially, whatever is is your life getting more efficient as you go? Yes. Or is it just becoming, you know, it, it's, it is what it is and you're going to do it till you can't do it. Um, and from what I'm hearing from you is based on, um, you know, higher and higher overhead, the, the throttling down, if you will, isn't that's probably a real concern of most doctors is like yeah. they're not really able to uh you know back in the day it was easier to you know for instance you come out of medical school you have debt the reimbursements were such that your debt could be paid off easily in a couple of years oh, yeah, and I made good money and uh, you would use that money and put it in all the things that the planners tell you to put it in. And uh, you know, life would go fairly well. You think about retirement and uh, you start throttling down. And then, you know, back in the day, you sell your practice, you get a nice little lump and then you, you go on uh, off into the sunset. But that's not the way it's structured now. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the, the debt alone can be... Oh, the debt now is astronomical. Uh, the, the, the price of education has, you know, since I went to medical school, oh my God, it, it's unbelievable. It, it's like buying a, a very 
high-priced home now. It's like coming out of medical school with a, a luxury home mortgage. Hmm. And then try and go get a mortgage. <laughs> exactly. So in your opinion, like what, what would you suggest to somebody that is doing this right now? And then I'll, I'll give you some thoughts, but what do you suggest? Uh, you know, I, as you know, John, I, I don't practice anymore and I kind of switched gears because I, I did get burnt out on this and, and I became more entrepreneurial. And what a lot of doctors don't realize is that there are other ways to use their, their credibility to generate additional income. And, you know, the one thing I would tell doctors to do right from the get-go is besides practicing medicine, look for another money pipeline somewhere along the line to, to kind of have another flow of income coming in. I, I think that's essential. Uh, the other big problem with doctors is taxes. Oh, my God. Uh, you've got to have a really efficient tax strategy because if you don't, uh, you know, it, no matter how much more you make, the taxes just eat it away. So you get to the point where, you know, if you make 200000 you want to make 300000 that difference in taxes between two and 300000 eats away all of that hard work that you've done to make that uh, additional money just go away to taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, again, having an investment strategy that's safe uh, is important too, because a lot of doctors get desperate and they kind of roll the dice and, and kind of chase things on Wall Street and it becomes kind of like going to the casino. And as we all saw back in 2008, a lot of people got wiped out. And, uh, you know, as I know now, there are safer ways to weather those kinds of storms, mm -hmm. uh, which if they put in place in the beginning, they're not going to be, you know, knocked off course if something like that happens. And uh, again, one of the big concerns of all doctors is that we're all human is having something happen during the practice of medicine and getting sued and losing everything. So also setting themselves up to safeguard against that type of risk, I think is essential when starting out. You know, uh, security against lawsuits. I mean, we all have malpractice insurance, but what a lot of doctors don't realize, you get sued three times in a row and the malpractice insurance drops you. I had that right. African surgeon friend of mine back east. Great surgeon, uh, you know, and, and I mean, this guy was competent. He just had three really bad cases close together and he got dropped and now he's teaching somewhere. Uh, he's no longer able to, to practice as a surgeon because no malpractice company will touch him. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. That's just, it sounds like a, a very tough career at this point. It's challenging. Yeah. Well, I'll just add a couple things here. You know, some of the things you mentioned as far as the tips, you know, it goes right along with what uh, you and I have talked about a lot. And essentially, there's three pillars of wealth. And you almost hit them right on the head right here. Number one is tax strategy. And what I mean by tax strategy isn't qualified accounts. Every doctor I run into has a big qualified account because why? Because the CPA said go defer the income. Well, if you're in, you know, if you're, if you're going to be in the medical 
uh, feel and build some assets and so forth. When qualified plans started, the top tax rate was 70%. Now it's nowhere near that. And we've got a government that's spending a trillion dollars a year more than they take in. And why that's important is if you're building assets up and you know, the last thing you want to do when you retire is then be still in a top tax bracket. Would you want to be in a top tax bracket for the rest of your life? No, no. And, and you know, that's one thing I, I never realized with the deferred benefit plan is, you know, I always assumed, well, you know, you'll, you'll start taking it out when you need it and oh yeah, there'll be tax there. But then when you start doing the math, you know, you see a quantity of money in that deferred uh, benefit plan, but mm -hmm. it's illusion because a percentage of it belongs to the IRS. And, you know, say you want to take out a hundred grand uh, a year and, you know, the tax rate's 35%. Well, you got to take out 135 and 35 you give to Uncle Sam. So if you were planning on living on that much a year, uh, you know, you, you have less than what you thought. And I think a lot of doctors really don't pay attention to that. No. And I'll tell you right now, just off of that right there, I'll just mention three. I'm not going to go into detail, but instead of a deferred account, you can do what we call a 401k condo. That's using real estate instead of using a uh, qualified plan. Way more flexible. You actually get a deduction instead of a deferral. Deferral is just kicking the can down the road to an unknown interest rate. I, I always look at it, it's like playing chicken with the future tax, tax rates. Who knows what they're going to be? Second possibility would be what's called conservation easements. And these are for people that are up there. You know, if you're making three, four hundred thousand and above, there are groups out there, some of the best in the country work with our firm that do conservation easements. And those can save, again, they are, this is tax elimination, not deferral. Uh, so that's another possibility. And then there's insurance programs out there that can offer some serious uh, tax deduction. Those are just three, there's others, but that is advanced tax strategy. Deferral, like qualified accounts, like a 401k, a defined benefit, all that. You know what that is to me? That's a cop-out. That's a cop-out because it's, it's not looking at real, like, like when a company like Amazon doesn't pay any taxes in 2017, 2018, they weren't deferring taxes, they eliminated taxes. So real strategy is all is using things that average people like your employees are using. They're fine for them. Somebody's in a 401k making 50 grand a year. When they retire that 401k and their social security, they'll be fine. They won't be in the tax top tax bracket. And so that's just one thought there. Number two on the pillars is something you mentioned over here. Uh, I think it was, Oh, number one on your list, create another form of income. Passive income or pipelines, as I like to call them. Those can be multiple different things. They could be real estate. It could be even um, finding some other type of company that offers complimentary uh, services that would help your patients that you just, you're like a licensee. You're like uh, George Foreman with the George Foreman grill. You know, you've got X amount of patients that could use this, that creates a pipeline that you don't have to pay the overhead and all the nonsense to, right? Right. And then number three of the three pillars of wealth is leverage. Leverage, and I'm writing terrible today, Nick, but leverage is the difference between having enough to fund your private wealth 
and your practice and growth and all of it and creating these. So what leverage does, and here's what's interesting, this is what a lot of people don't understand and a lot of doctors probably never even seen it before. When you have like, what is the actual valuable thing in a practice? Do you know what it is? The actual valuable thing in the practice is, you know, goodwill, reputation. I'll tell you what, a, let me, I, I phrased it wrong. From a financial point of view. From a financial point of view, what would a bank loan on? Um, your, your gross receipts um, over the past several years. Basically your profit. Yeah. So if, if a, let's just use an example, say, and I'm going to use a crazy example just for fun. Say your net worth is zero. And in your business account, you've got just enough to make this. So we're just going to call it zero because you, do, you have just enough to pay all the employees and pay the rent. I'm just going to use worst case scenario. You've got zero personal wealth, maybe even negative, maybe even you have cars and ex-wives and everything, whatever's going on <laughs> is what it is. So this is personal wealth. This is business. And maybe you have equipment and things, but all those are leased. So they're not really yours. This profit is what most business owners, regardless whether physicians or whatever, the profit is what is ignored. But let me show you something. If you own a practice, and let's say that the profit was a million a year, I'm just using a round example. And that practice without you there, you could just insert another doctor and it would go on and on. Obviously there might be, let's just say uh, it is really relationship based, but some of them aren't. Some of them, you know, yeah. medically, it doesn't have any relationship. The further the relationship part of it is, the higher the number. But to give you a range, if it's all relationship based, you're probably going to get about one times revenue or one times profit. So one million. If if it's totally removed from that, but it's a medical type of practice, you're going to probably get five to six times that revenue. So that means you know, five to six million dollars. We'll just call it five million dollars. Here's why that's important. I'm, I'm taking this to give you a lesson for the people that'll see this. If two things, number one, if this guy's sitting here with no personal net worth, there are ways to extract this number from the business and have this start coming over here and working for him and now have $5 million roughly working for him, growing at interest. That's number one. Number two, he's able to, the way that works is we use an insurance program that does that. I'm not gonna get into all the details on that, but also he would then have maximum insurance coverage. Using this one piece that's sitting in his practice that's not, it's almost like having a paid off house and you earn zero on the equity. Like if you own a house for $500,000 and it's paid off, that 500 grand is earning zero, right? So it's the same concept, but here's the real issue, Nick, Dr. Messina, sorry, is this, remember back over here, we we're talking about lawsuits when you said losing it all is a concern. Yeah. By accessing this, you know what you're able to do? This number is actually what they would sue you on. They don't care about anything else. I mean, obviously, if you have a huge net worth and a huge business value for whatever reason, you know, just equipment and things like that, that are buildings but they're gonna sue you assuming, like they're not gonna take your building. What they wanna look at is your profit. 
So this is when they calculate, there's been a lot of business owners sued that thought they didn't have anything to sue for. One attorney's going to go, let me see your books. You're making a million bucks a year. That equates if we sold this business today to X, we're going to sue against that. And then they garnish the future salaries, don't they? Yes. Now here's the point. If you're able to, and I'm not saying everybody on here can do this, but there are strategies if you're qualified for it to extract that money, have it go to work. And also when that's done, the bank puts, I call it, I don't want to say it the wrong way, but it's like a fake lien. It's a lien against your profit, but it doesn't cost, it's not a lien because the money's actually right there to pay off the lien at any time. But anybody that would be looking at the practice to sue would see a five, I'm just using round numbers here. They would see a $5 million lien against the profit. Guess what? It blocked with a firewall your income. Now, what we're looking at here, Nick, just to <laughs> keep it real, this is advanced planning. This isn't going to your, you know, XYZ advisor and talking about where the next Amazon stock is going to be. This is protecting the business, which is the big asset, which is really based on the profits, right? Yeah. And blocking that. But here's the beauty of this. This is just one of many programs that are out there. But this program, the other point is that it takes that $5 million that's a business. They're loaning to the business. And there's a way to structure it to get that money over into personal wealth. So that even if he lost the business or was sued or whatever, it's not even part of the business. How powerful is that? Wow. And this takes this guy back to our, that's why I wanted to go through these first to see what the concerns were. It takes this same person who had no light at the end of the tunnel and immediately creates a light that's not 40 years from now, it's maybe five, 10, 15 years max. So John, that, that $5 million is sitting in an interest bearing account, but you've, yeah. got to, you've got to pay interest on that loan, right? Yes. What's with that. So I'm just, and again, Nick, we're just using round numbers here, but 5 million, right now the interest rates are running around 4%. You could control that with about 200,000 a year. But here's the beauty. Again, because we do only advanced cases, there are companies out there that can create and structure that to where that is tax deductible. This person in California, because he's at a million a year, he's going to be at 50% or above in taxes. The interest is 200,000. That becomes a deduction. So take out the tax. 50% tax savings, he's controlling 100K, or he's controlling 5 million for 100,000 a year. And then he's, he's making whatever interest on a yearly basis that it's sitting in that account. That's correct. Now in this whole program, there's some insurance charges and so forth, but the insurance charges are actually like a fraction of what the tax tax savings is like this tax savings is so monumental it's unreal and I, I didn't want to get lost in that i was just trying to get you know what going back to the concerns and i'm just trying to show that there's ideas out there that are well beyond average if you will but think about this this is a question and this particular type of strategy because we use this one quite a bit look at this you're back in practice, go back a few years, you're back in practice. If you were taking 100,000 a year, how many years would it take you to save $5 million? Wow. 
50 years. 50 years, I don't have that. <laughs> and even at 7%, it would take about 25 years. Who's got, who wants 20? That goes back to that no light at the end of the tunnel. It's like my mom used to say to me, takes money to make money. What a lot of people, doctors and a lot of businesses owners don't understand is that the value of their business has nothing to do with what they have in checking account or out, a lot of times what they have out in the you know, equipment. It's all right here setting in their profits. And if you're, and I'm not saying everybody qualifies for this, to qualify for something like this, you need to be at a million dollars a year in profit for it to make sense for this particular program. And you need to have some net worth and you gotta be in decent health. But if all those are in place, we've seen this just immediately do some crazy cool stuff. But the point to you and me is, would you rather, let me just take it out here just real quick. Say, instead, this doctor says, I can squeeze out after lifestyle taxes and everything, 100,000 a year. And I'm gonna put that at 7% or even 10%, I'll put 10%. End of the first year, 110,000. You know, take it on out to 10 years, He's still going to be, you know, think about it. He's going to be probably a million five, million six total. Mm -hmm. Let's say 1.6 million. This thing started at 5 million. And here's the math on that. If you think about it, 5 million. in years. Let's just say that it earned six. Earned six and cost four. So there's only a 2% spread just to keep it just to, as basic as possible. 2% on 5 million, what's that? 100 grand in profit, right? Mm -hmm. He's using 100 to go make 100, 100% return on his money with a 2% difference. And he doesn't have to bear the market risk with that because it's zero market risk. The banks, in fact, don't allow the risk because they're putting so much money and they want it in something completely market, uh, non-market driven. So zero uh, market risk. But what the point is, is this. He's using 100,000. I mean, because you're going to look at this, the real account, I'm just using raw numbers here, 6%. At the end of first year, he's at 5.3 million in there. Versus this, at the end of 10 years, doing it his way. In fact, I went way over on that because he's putting 100,000 in, it's gonna be more like a million two after all that, even with interest. Look at that, that's in first year. Take out a little bit because there's some insurance involved here. Let's say he's at 5.25. Which account do you want? And in this case, he's got five, say this is a 50 year old doctor, he'd probably have around 10 million of uh, face permanent insurance as well. So this guy over here, no light. This guy over here, doesn't matter whether he dies, gets sick, doesn't, nothing matters, because he's got it going on. This program, in fact, I have to mention this, this act, I didn't know we were gonna get into this today, but I just wanted to throw an idea out here. This program was actually designed for surgeons down in Florida that were afraid of getting sued. It was designed about 15 years ago. But nobody's heard of it because most advisors don't even know how it works because they work with average clients. They don't work with people at the higher end. So to wrap it all up, or let me ask you this before we wrap it up. Any questions? I know I covered a bunch of stuff here to John Madden. I love my John Madden style. 
No, that, that pretty much covers the concerns. And, and you know, uh, in total transparency, John, you know, uh, I've been your client for 10 years, and my only wish is that I met you 30 years ago uh, and had instituted a lot of these things because, uh, you know, my course has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, I just wish I had another 20 years of it preceding that uh, because I've never, I've been through so many planners in the past and I've never heard about any of this from any one of them. Well, I'll tell you this, if you'd have met me 30 years ago, which I've been in the business just coming up 30 years, I didn't know all this stuff either. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, it's been a process of yeah. learning, yeah, growing, and you've been a great help. And uh, you know, I always laugh and call you my constant client because you're so smart in in so many things, and, and money's one of them. And this, the three pillars, the way I look at it is like this. It's so simple. Everybody's like, if you watch the news, they tell you focus on what the market, you know, what's going on, all, all the chaos in the world and, and the political stuff, all this stuff going on. Here's the deal. If this came from studying hundred million plus dollar estates and big companies like Amazon, if you have, this is the exact order right here. Boom, boom. Actually, I would put leverage as number two, the better order. Tax strategy frees up so you can get leverage. Then you create massive amounts of pipelines. When you have number one alone, it actually will give you a better outlook. When you start adding leverage and, and passive income, though, this all goes away. And like me and you were always talking about, the what is the ultimate goal? Ultimate goal. Break one thing. The time for money trap. I don't care if you're a doctor, I don't care what you do. When you break that, you are now financially independent. And you cannot, I argue, that you cannot do it. Where's this guy? You can't do it like this unless you want to wait till you're about 85 years old. And by then, who cares? <laughs> Maybe your kids or grandkids yeah. will actually break the time. <laughs> They'll never go to work. <laughs> They just won't go to work. <laughs> but this is something that very few people in society ever do. But once you do, what I have seen with actual clients is their productive productivity actually goes up because all the stress is gone. They can go do the things they really wanted to do. I, I mean, when you first explained this to me, it seemed so logical. I mean, you're, you're freeing up the money with the tax strategy that was already earmarked to go to the IRS. You're taking that and you're leveraging it and getting a bigger amount of money that you now control. It also has a tax deduction on the front end if you're incorporated and you're making safe income on the difference between what the loan cost and what it's paying in interest. And it, it also is set up like a firewall against getting sued. It, yeah. it seems so logical. So for doctors, especially, the leverage also equals a form of asset protection. Yeah. And in, in that in itself, you know, uh, that, that account where it's growing on the difference of what the loan cost and uh, what, what you're earning on it. The other thing that I learned from you is unlike a, an IRA or a SEP or something like that, all the growth in that end of it is tax-free, isn't it? 
Yeah, because we're using, um, you're talking about this one? Yeah. yeah. So what we're using as an insurance plan. Right. And now a lot of doctors have seen those, but what we're doing is hyper funding it to the brim. You're using it like a rich person. More money. You're, you're using it like a Roth for rich people. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then the way the money comes out is income as via a loan. So it is not even a reportable income. So it's non-reportable. It doesn't affect anything. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, you'd retire and be drawing a million dollars a year out of this thing and not paying a dime of tax and getting full social security and not having that tax. And you don't have to pay that loan back because it'll just come off of the death benefit, right? You can structure it like that. You can pay it off. Most There's no real reason to pay it off. Yeah. The plan itself will continue to pay that loan interest after you, the, the build on these is anywhere from three to uh, three to five and, and preferably, you know, it depends on the age. You can be out to 10 years and you just build it from depending on age and so forth and health. But it's, it's a simple, it's a complex program, but it's simple what it's doing. It's basically, it, it's you're partnering with a bank and an insurance company and you could even say the tax code and all three of these are making you know you much better off in this particular program you know john what would what would you say would be the minimum? Like if there's a doctor out there, you know, he's doing okay. Obviously one answer is the younger, the better because you get more advantage, but what would be the minimum somebody could be making, uh, in, in what their net worth would have to be to even like get started on a low end form of something like this. Well, here's what's interesting. Like, and I, that you brought up a point I didn't even cover here. When you're calculating, like, here's the real minimums. And the, but before anybody freaks out, let me show you what I'm talking about. You need to really be in around a million a year in profit to make this happen in the right way. Number two, five million net worth. But before you freak out, it includes the business valuation. So in this particular case, say this guy here was making a million a year, and let's just say we valued his business because of his relationships and so forth. Say that was $3 million, just the business itself, and he had $2 million between his other assets, he qualifies. Like he doesn't have to have 5 million cash setting off in the, to do this. And if his business as a physician, maybe it's even somebody that owns the, uh, what were you telling me? Like the medical spots, things oh, like yeah. that. Medical spa or even like somebody that owns an urgent care center or something of that sort. But the point is hands off. If he isn't even involved, but he owns it. Mm -hmm. Now that factor could be five, six or more times that revenue. So in that case, 1 million a year times five, he's at the net worth level. Mm -hmm. So it's not that hard to get done, but we, you know, could you qualify a little bit lower than that? You can, but we don't like to see people try and do this under that because we don't want any problems. We want people to be happy in this, not, it shouldn't affect any other any other factor of your life. Um, their lifestyle. Yeah, there are plans, and again, I'm what I wanted to focus mainly on today, Nick, is this three pillars because you can do them. Up. What is that? There's how many ways to skin a cat? Like, there's a lot of way to do it. We're, we we kind of got off on a tangent here, which it's good we did, but there are plans that are below this, that do some of the same things as well. 
kind of like a starter plan, training wheels uh, on your way to this. Yes, absolutely. But but or maybe my, you never. Maybe you're not actually ever wanting to be doing these type of things, but you're a little more conservative. What I'm saying is there are uh, scaled down plans as well as there are planning uh, planned or ideas for the doctor that's 60 years old, that's, you know, worth 30 million, maybe a plastic surgeon or whatever um, that you can use. It still always goes back. This is what my point is. It always still goes back to here. If you had zero dollars, zero anything, it still goes to pillars of wealth because this is how wealth is built, not focusing on a market, not looking at chaos constantly. Yeah, so, good stuff. Like, like I, I always say, man, I wish I knew about this stuff 30 years ago. And in any regard, even the, you know, variants of this plan and because you've showed them to me makes so much more sense than going the deferred benefit route uh, which which everybody is offered I, I I don't know why they just keep offering that it seems to me like it's setting up a hidden tax bomb yeah it when those started the tax rate top tax rate was seventy percent. So it looked like a deal. You know, now we're setting under 40%, right? Yeah, but with what, $12 trillion national debt? You know, you think taxes are going up or down. <laughs> well, even beyond that, they're devalued. The, a ninth, not to get lost, but yeah. the dollar itself has lost 86% of its value since 1971. What that means is they keep deflating the purchasing power which means even in retirement, you're gonna, you know, from things like uh, social security and, and, and even if you own rental properties and stuff like that, the dollars are gonna be coming a lot higher, which is, cause I always call it the, would, would look at it as the double kick in the wallet, right? When you earn more, we have progressive taxes. So as you earn, the tax rate goes right with it. But if they're decreasing the value, the purchasing power, well, you're earning more and more, but it's really not more and more. It's just more numbers. And so it's forcing you into higher and higher tax rates. It's the double kick in the wallet. Well, this, this would be something to talk about at another time, but, but that is just horrible. I was going to call it the double kick and something else, but double kick in the wall, it works. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> but maybe, a, 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 you know, that's a good topic for another time, but uh, I heard you talk about ways to beat that as well. Well, again, it, it, anything and everything I talk about will base back off of those the three pillars and then tie in strategy to get there. So there's specific strategy to get there, depending on your level of assets, income, etc. But you can, this is what they never taught in my first 20 years in financial business. No one ever taught anything. And even today, nobody talks about any of this. I had to find this working with super high net worth clients and research and study and, 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 and the fact is, it's just not common knowledge. It's not common. I, I had never heard of it before. And, you know, I dealt with a lot of, I, I took care of a lot of, you know, financial people uh, in a very, a very affluent part of the country. And I've been to cocktail party. I, I never heard any of these concepts discussed. Never. Well, it, it's something that it's almost like a, uh, a game of, what do you want to call it? Like a game of keeping your eye on something that doesn't really matter. Well, 
it, just imagine, I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you had all three of these working like a charm, you had your taxes down to almost zero using these type of things, not deferring, eliminating, becoming like Amazon. Passive income streams, not only one, having multiple, they just keep growing. And you had leverage that kept growing too. Do you care what's going on over in a stock market? No. Do you care what's going on in the chaos? I mean, maybe you care a little bit, but you're not beholden to it. Like, I don't know if I can retire. That's the difference. That is the difference that it took me 10 years of intense study to figure this out at a different level. Good stuff as usual, John. <laughs> well, hey, let's, I'm gonna just back it all out here.